microphones. It looks like we're ready to get started. So I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to our speakers to begin. Maureen, it's all yours. Good morning, everybody. And thanks, Sam. Uh, my name is Mo Essen, and I will serve as the moderator for the first half of this session. I work with the US Forest Service Rocky Mountain Research Station's Human Dimensions Program as a social science analyst. My program, my program, listen to me, my pronouns are she, her, and I sit in Missoula, Montana on lands taken from the Flathead, Kootenai, and Upper Ponderay tribes. Thanks again for joining us for this special session. I organized it together with my colleague, Dan Williams, and it's titled Increasing Social and Ecological Resilience to Wildfire Risk, the Role of Collective Action. Broadly speaking, collective action problems arise when social and environmental problems are connected to the actions of people and organizations and the outcomes of these actions are interdependent on one another. Wildfire risk has been rooted or noted, excuse me, as a problem that requires collective action to mitigate and foster adaptation. This session includes a star studded set of presenters that will examine ways to frame wildfire risk as a boundary crossing collective action problem to deepen our understanding of collective action, collective solutions, and the role of landscape-based context in forming wildfire ad adaptation strategies. I hope you stick around for this and the following time block. So I'm gonna go ahead and move to introducing our first presenter today. Our first presenter is Susan, Susan Sharnley. Susan Charnley is a research social scientist with the Forest Service Pacific Northwest Research Station based in Portland, Oregon. Her talk aims to set the stage for today's session by focusing on the concept of collective action and its relevance for increasing resilience to wildfire risk. Join me in welcoming Susan. Okay, great. Thanks, Mo. Uh, appreciate it. And as Mo said, uh, what I'd like to do is to frame wildfire as a collective action problem in order to set the stage for the other speakers this morning. We're going to be talking about collective strategies for wildfire adaptation that cross jurisdictional boundaries. So I want to begin by just showing some data here from the National Interagency Fire Center. Um, as we uh, can see here, the average number of wildfires in the United States has been decreasing slightly over the past 35 years. But at the same time, the average annual number of acres that have burned has more than doubled. And what that means is that wildfires are getting bigger. And in particular, we are experiencing more megafires over 100,000 acres in size that are causing more and more undesirable losses. At the same time, we are spending more and more money suppressing wildfires. Back in the mid 80s to the mid 90s, we were spending roughly a half a billion dollars every year to suppress wildfires. And in the last 10 decades, that's been risen to closer to one and a half to two and a half billion dollars a year to suppress these large wildfires in particular. So what are we going to do to try and address this growing problem? Well, the National Cohesive Wildland Fire Management Strategy, which was developed in 2014, identifies uh, restoring and maintaining fire resilient landscapes across jurisdictions as one of its main goals. And of course, that's the focus of our session today. How do we go about doing this? And in fact, there couldn't be a better time to try and focus on this goal because the recently enacted Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act will provide the Forest Service with about $3 billion over the next five years to reduce the risk of wildland fire and to restore ecosystems. This is roughly about double the amount of money that we've been spending in recent years. So this is great, but how do we in fact operationalize this goal? Well, the fire ecologists tell us that from an ecological standpoint, we need to go out and reduce hazardous fuels and we need to do it on really large scales, on the scales of thousands of hectares. Now we don't have to treat fuels everywhere. And in fact, that would be impractical and uneconomical, but we do have to do it at large scales and we do have to do it in a way that's strategic. 
So in other words, we want to target high hazard areas where wildfire is most likely to ignite and to burn. What does this mean from a social standpoint? It means that in order to effectively treat fuels at large landscape scales, in order to reduce the risk of these very large wildfires that we've been having, we need to get multiple landowners and multiple landowner types to participate in fuels reduction and to coordinate with each other when they do so. And the importance of coordination stems from the fact that we do want to be strategic in developing these strategies so that we can target the most high hazard areas. So in other words, uncoordinated fuels treatments on individual land ownerships don't necessarily add up to or optimize landscape scale wildfire risk reduction. So these ecological and social features of, uh, that characterize uh, the wildfire problem today make it a collective action problem. <clears throat> so what do we mean by collective action? Well, in the context of wildfire risk reduction, we mean it's a situation when interdependent landowners organize and coordinate forest management with each other to improve their joint outcomes. Basically, the idea is you're gonna get a better outcome by working together than you would if you worked inter independently. And uh, Mo talked about this concept of interdependence when she gave her introduction. What does it mean that landowners are interdependent in the wildfire context? Well, it means that the likelihood of a fire burning on your property is a function of conditions on your own ownership, as well as conditions on neighboring land ownership. So if you're the landowner on the left uh, and you treat fuels on your property, well, that's great. You have control over what happens on your own ownership. But if your neighbor looks like the uh, person on the right there, they are going to increase the risk of wildfire arriving at your property boundaries. And so basically to most effectively reduce wildfire risk, you have to act together because each individual's actions affect the collective good or the collective benefit. Well, there are two different kinds of collective action problems. So I just wanna step back and talk a little bit more about this concept. The two kinds of collective action problems are public goods and common coal resources. So what's the difference between them? Well, in both cases, it's difficult to exclude people who don't contribute uh, to uh, collective action from receiving the collective benefit of that action. But in the case of common pool resources, resource consumption by one person subtracts from resource availability for somebody else. So for example, the more fish you catch, the fewer fish there are for me to catch out in the ocean. On the other hand, in the case of public goods, there is no subtractability. So in other words, my ability to benefit from something does not take away from your ability to benefit. I would suggest that fire resilient forests are uh, an <clears throat> example of, an, of a public good. And I think it's important to understand the difference between these two kinds of, uh, of, of collective action because um, each kind requires a different set of actions in order to address it. So if we think about uh, collective action to create fire resilient forests as a public good, the first thing that we want to ensure is that we have as many people as possible participating in undertaking fuels treatments, particularly in those target locations and um, particularly large landowners because they can have a larger impact on the landscape. And the more people that participate they create what's called in the, in the language of public goods, a convex production function. In other words, the first people who go out and treat fuels are gonna create a small collective benefit, but as more and more people contribute and participate in fuels reduction, that benefit becomes bigger and bigger. So you wanna get as many landowners as possible engaged, but in addition, uh, the benefit of having large participation is that you have more people to share the cost of providing the benefit. More people bring more resources to the table to contribute to the activities and basically you increase overall capacity to provide that benefit. Well, when it comes to collective action talk, people talk about the free riding problem. How are you gonna get people to benefit uh, or sorry, to participate when it's possible to free ride? 
And basically what free riding means is you get the benefit of collective action without contributing to the cost. Well, I think that in hazardous fuels reduction, there's actually an incentive not to free ride. And uh, the reason is, again, if you are this landowner and you've treated fuels well around your property, you're less likely to be vulnerable to wildfire when it occurs than as if you are this landowner here. So actually you're much worse, even though you get some benefit from your neighbor's treatments, you're still gonna be much worse off if you fail to treat on your property than if you do go ahead and treat. So this creates an incentive not to free ride. So I don't see personally free riding as being a big problem uh, for collective action to reduce wildfire risk. So the other thing we need besides participation among large numbers of landowners in order to reduce uh, wildfire risk and create these fire resilient forest landscapes, again, is to get landowners to coordinate with each other. Um, and the reason you wanna coordinate again is because you wanna strategically design treatments to optimize their effectiveness and put them in those places where, high, uh, where fire hazard is highest. Now there can be different forms of coordination. You can coordinate by simply communicating with your neighbors and sharing information about your treatment plans and actions because that information might affect what they do. You can actually get together with your neighbors and plan treatments together so that you uh, design them and put them in places in a way that they can have a greater collective benefit. You might also work with your neighbors to coordinate fundraising to finance those treatments. And you might also coordinate in conducting required uh, analyses that have to occur before you do the treatments. So there's lots of different ways of working together in planning. And then you can also potentially implement your treatments together which just means getting work done on the ground in some kind of coordinated fashion, whether or not you're implementing those treatments jointly and simultaneously. Well, this all sounds great, except for the fact that we know that in these fire prone forest landscapes of the West, we have very diverse landowners and landowner types. These diverse landowners have different management goals and approaches. They may have different perceptions of wildfire risk, they have different capacities to take action, most likely, and treat fuels on their properties. There may be different regulations that govern their behavior, and they have different incentive systems for engaging in the activity. So what do we do about that? Well, uh, given this diversity, when do we think collective action is going to emerge, and how do we try and foster it? I wanna briefly review five principles that emerged from research that I conducted on collective action for wildfire risk reduction with two of my colleagues, Paige Fisher and Aaron Kelly. And I wanna talk about um, these principles, which we did not invent, but we adapted them from the work of Eleanor Ostrom because we found that in uh, effective cases of cross-boundary wildfire risk reduction, all five of these principles were often operating and when one of them wasn't present, then like landowners were actually less likely to engage in hazardous fuels reduction. So the first one is that landowners must have a shared understanding of how wildfire operates, how their actions affect it, and they need to understand that acting collectively to reduce wildfire risk is going to have a better outcome than acting individually or in an, un or an uncoordinated fashion. So clearly the implication here is that it's really important to do education and outreach to landowners and should, in order to pr pr promote this shared understanding, particularly to those landowners that are in the high priority areas for uh, treating fuels. Second, landowners need to be able to communicate and develop coordinated strategies with one another for wildfire risk reduction. And things that can help foster that are things like creating opportunities for landowners to interact maybe through multi-stakeholder processes for developing these coordinated approaches, there has to be a forum for people to engage and to develop partnerships along the way. Third, people have to have the capacity to uh, undertake these coordinated strategies for wildfire risk reduction. And for example, they might require some financial and technical assistance in order to increase their capacity to participate. Fourth, landowners must trust that if they change their behavior and treat their fuels, their neighbors will too. 
Often it can be a disincentive to treat your own property if you feel like your neighbor isn't going to do anything about wildfire hazard on their property because the benefit to you will not be nearly as great as if you are in it together. And then fifth, there has to be a, a favorable benefit cost ratio for the landowner. In other words, a landowner has to perceive that the long-term joint benefits of coordinated wildfire risk reduction are going to exceed the short-term individual costs of collective action. And again, in order to foster this principle, uh, there might be things like uh, financial assistance and technical assistance that can reduce the cost to the landowner of treating. Uh, there may be ways of reducing the amount of time you have to invest in working with others to, to develop these coordinated strategies, et cetera. The bottom line though uh, of my talk today is that collective action for cross-boundary wildfire management, I think is critical for increasing forest resilience to wildfire risk. And at the same time, uh, it's important to know that the forms that it's going to take are going to vary depending on the local context. There's really no blueprint for how to go about this. It's gonna look different in different places. And similarly, the kinds of interventions that can best support it are likely to vary across ownerships and landscapes. So I think it's important to try and look in particular places at how we can best invest in fostering collective action and help different kinds of landowners engage in this process. I think it's also case, the case that collective action may not be appropriate everywhere. There may be certain conditions under which it's just not needed or the benefit is not uh, worth the cost that would be invested in trying to act collectively. So we really have to assess what's going on in different places. So my talk today has talked uh, about a lot of abstract concepts, but I think in the presentations that follow during the two special sessions this morning, we're gonna move from these abstract ideas to concrete examples of what collective action for increasing resilience to wildfire risk across jurisdictions actually looks like on the ground, including the conditions that enable or constrain it. And hopefully we'll gain a number of insights about how to promote it. So I look forward to the talks that follow this morning. Um, thanks very much. And that's my email address in case you would like to reach out. So thanks, now Karen. I'm going to stop, to stop screen sharing. There we go. Thanks, Susan. Do we have questions for Susan? Maureen, I do not see any questions, but I encourage folks to add any questions you have in the chat or the Q&A. And um, it looks like we just have about a minute and a half left of this time block. So if we don't end up with any questions, we could introduce our next speaker. Well, maybe I'll just present a question quickly to Susan and see um, just to take up some of that time too. Um, Susan, I'm wondering, based on all of your work over the years, um, focusing on collective action, what is the you know, one or two biggest sort of take home points that you wanna share with this audience in terms of um, how to make collective action work on the ground? Well, I guess I would go back to those um, five principles that I talked about. Um, I think it's really important. Uh, I think all of them are important. And in fact, um, as I mentioned, when one of those things is an operative, um, you're much less likely to get it. I think that one of the things we've found that really helps incentivize collective action is when you have organized efforts that um, provide funding in order to undertake the work. I think funding is a great trigger for uh, getting people to come together and self-organize in order to take advantage of opportunities that are available to reduce wildfire risk on their shared landscapes. So um, I think that, you know, it's not just something that an individual is going to think to do on their own. There has to be organized efforts. There have to be strong partnerships. There has to be funding incentives and support systems along the way, as well as a lot of education and outreach to make it, uh, make it something that people feel like it's worth investing in. Great. Well, thanks, Susan. Sure. So we'll go ahead and move to our next speaker, which is actually me. So I'm going to go ahead and introduce myself. Um, for those of you who just joined us, welcome. My name is Mo Essen. Uh, since I'm the moderator also, um, I'm going to, like I said, introduce myself in my talk. 
Um, I work with the US Forest Service Rocky Mountain Research Station Human Dimensions Program as a social science analyst. My, pro my pronouns are she and her, and I sit in Missoula, Montana on lands taken from the Flathead, Kootenai, and Upper Ponderay tribes. I will be talking about key distinctions between conceptualizations of wildfire and the need or, and the use for expanded and complementary approaches to further fire adaptation. So I'm gonna go ahead and switch my settings so I can share my screen here. Bear with me for one moment. There we go. That looks great. Okay. Great. Well, thank you. So today I'll be sharing a review paper about a mindset shift regarding wildfire risk that we think my co-authors and I think may improve outcomes. I want to thank my co-authors, Sarah McCaffrey, Jesse Abrams, and Travis Favelio, um, the conference organizers, my colleagues in this special session, and the funders of this work, US Forest Service, State and Private Forestry, and the Rocky Mountain Research Station. So we're all keenly aware that many ecosystems are reliant upon fire. Humans inhabiting these environments have clearly co-evolved with fire over millennia and that the wildfire challenges are only increasing. We also know that lots of smart people have already tried to explain why wildfire management seems to be resistant to change. We're gonna go ahead and throw our hats into that ring and expand on this conversation. We propose that one reason for this resistance to change is related to how risk is predominantly conceptualized and therefore problematized. We focus on conceptualizations or paradigms as conceptualizations inform problem definitions. Problem definitions also define decision spaces, in this case for wildfire risk. Our argument here is that the way wildfire and wildfire risk, excuse me, our argument here is that the way wildfire and wildfire risk is currently conceptualized may be problematic and actually impeding wildfire adaptation. The focus seems too narrow to yield realistic and applicable solutions given both the complexity of the issue and the diverse manner these complexities manifest across varied social ecological systems, as Susan was talking about just a minute ago. So my co-authors and I look to existing social science to see what we could find that may add value. Let's start by thinking about the current picture. What comes to mind when we think of risk, wildfire risks specifically? Maybe it's some combination of technical experts considering something related to the likelihood of exposure or the intensity or flame length of a fire and the given spatial extent and scale. And maybe it also includes fire effects. And of course, it will include some set or a, at least one value at risk. Another way to describe this leading perspective on risk is having the overarching goal of minimizing the costs and or minimizing the loss to selected values at risk. This may be operationalized using an engineering-based systems framework for calculating or modeling the probability of loss, exposure, or risk that is informed by an actuarial or insurance approach. Once these models are calculated, the intent is often to deliver the model or the tool and the associated information it provides to decision makers like agencies or local residents to subsequently adopt. The literature refers to this as simple risk. Within this current picture, we often see approaches to risk that favor the importance of reducing ideas, problems to their simplest form in an effort to pinpoint calculatable and predictable relationships between the correct variables. Give primacy to technical desk knowledge or knowledge produced from the hypothetical deductive model and use uses approaches that rely on data that are now freely available after decades of R&D investment. Examples of these data include satellite imagery and census data. As I mentioned, we primarily see the one-way flow of information from technical expert to end user, like an agency or WUI resident. Literature refers to this as an undemocratic monopoly of interpretation 
that gives technical experts more power and authority to make judgments about addressing risk, including determining viable solutions and distributing valuable resources available for minimizing related losses. Rational choice thinking underpins this view in that risk management focuses on decisions and actions of individual actors, an individual resident or household or an individual agency, and that these decisions occur largely independently of one another. In some approaches in this perspective often focus on terms like efficiencies and optimization while pointing to individual residents or agencies to successfully address risk alone. Consequently, the emphasis is on controllability, predictability, certainty, and security, hallmarks of risk management using actuarial approaches. Examples of this mindset are a number of quantitative risk maps. So I'm just gonna back up for just a minute so, and, and ask, so why are we even having this conversation about the current mindset of wildfire risk? The literature that my co-authors and I reviewed pointed to several interesting limitations to the prevailing mindset. Mitigation outputs and tools that rely primarily on top-down, technical, technically driven solutions may not garner legitimacy from those that are intended to complete the mitigation activities such tools recommend. Maybe this lack of legitimacy stems from some of the things that Susan mentioned, um, accounting for the specific context, such as the different definitions of, of risk um, or the variety of capacities or limitations of, of residents. For example, some broad scale risk maps may not account for culturally important areas for tribal nations or residents that most value timber resources over recreations or over structures. Consequently, some such outputs may not be relevant to on the ground practitioners and residents, limiting the quote unquote adoption of these approaches. Thus, desired outcomes, including, including further wildfire adaptation may remain elusive. Also, the prevailing notion of risk has been referred to as the guardianship model, where government maintains authority and legitimacy, for instance, to protect homes during a wildfire incident but steers clear of directly addressing issues of private property rights. Instead, the private property issue is addressed through largely unidirectional education. Literature states that this may actually perpetuate the somewhat problematic expectation that the government or fire response resources can and do have the capacity to address wildfire risk alone. There is another mindset from the social science literature that expands on the prevailing paradigm. So think about, like I said, expanding from the current picture. So the goal now shifts so as not to focus primarily on minimizing risk, but to more explicitly broaden the focus to adapting to the risk over time in socially relevant and legitimate ways. This paradigm is informed by notions of wicked problems, natural hazards, risk governance, and second, modernity risk. It purposefully incorporates not only technical knowledge, but also practice and cultural knowledge, like indigenous knowledge, in a way that accounts for the social diversity surrounding wildfire. This serves to increase the social relevance and legitimacy of fire mitigation strategies and explicitly attend to justice and equity as one knowledge is not given primacy over the other. This paradigm is rooted in the notion that wildfire risk manifests in different ways in different places and therefore likely includes a different set of networked public and private institutions and organizations in each unique place. For example, wildfire risk may look one way in Eugene, Oregon, but may look very different in communities near Twist, Washington or in Athens, Greece. In other words, and perhaps similar to the diversity of ecological communities, we need to understand and account for the diversity among social communities as we would ecological communities. As a result, there is no universal solution to risk. As a part of this expanded view, approaches to risk broaden to where knowledge flows multi-directionally as opposed to unidirectionally, Decisions are co-produced and socially negotiated while also tending to equity and justice. Thus, the broadened paradigm is specifically designed to account for the diversity across and within 
wildfire prone areas as opposed to simplifying it. It purposely underscores wildfire as a collective action problem. The literature labels this paradigm complex risk. In the end, this view builds on the ideas of the current predominant view by emphasizing that single actors working at single scales like individual government agencies or individual WUI residents are often unable to sufficiently address contemporary risks in isolation. Instead, responsibility and authority for how social or how society anticipates and prepares for different hazards are increasingly ambiguous and shared, meaning that desirable outcomes are based on decisions and actions of a suite of interdependent entities making decisions and taking actions at a set of interrelated spatial, temporal, and institutional or agency scales. In terms of examples of this expanded view in practice, we're all probably somewhat familiar with um, FACNET, the Adaptive Communities Learning Network, and the Indigenous Peoples Burning Network. So I wanna take a moment to say, it's super important to note that we do not want to communicate that simple risk approaches are bad or wrong. This is not an either or situation. This is a yes and situation. Simple risk components are integral, just not sufficient. Finally, in an attempt to further support broadening from simple to complex risk, we devised five principles or suggestions. Social science literature emphasizes that these principles will develop risk mitigation efforts tailored to a variety of diverse conditions and therefore be a better fit to social community diversity to further adaptation to wildfire. In the interest of time, we've grouped these into two sets of related principles. The first group of recommendations are geared toward the growing the tent of folks legitimately engaged in wildfire risk, purposefully building a more inclusive set of processes that meaningfully incorporate different ways of knowing in different contexts, understanding and responding to the reality that technically tra traditionally trained experts cannot accurately represent the diverse set of realities of a broad range of people and groups. In other words, we need to bring a more diverse set of voices into the room where more, to more readily represent the diverse ways and issues opportunities manifest in fire prone areas. For example, in a data driven approach to wildfire risk, what counts as data? How does, for instance, indigenous cultural knowledge fit in? Together, these principles will help build the social architecture of a resourced, coordinated collective network of interrelated actors where different knowledges are valued and that supports innovative and adaptive decisions, activities and outcomes that account for the social and ecological diversity we know exists. The second set of principles address uneven distributions of risk and risk related resources. For example, do rural communities that likely have less exposure, exposure to structures specifically mean that rural areas should get less resources to address wildfire risk? Also, are we dispersing resources to groups that have some existing capacity to do wildfire risk already and have already done some of that work by requiring matching funds and grants? What about groups that don't have access to those financial resources to get that match or even personnel may be specifically trained and available to write grants? What does the focus on competitive grants do to risk mitigation work in relationship to justice and equity? Furthermore, as I'm sure you've heard, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. We recommend a more balanced approach to investments that focuses on building pre and post social architecture to address risk long before and after an incident occurs, understanding that this will pay dividends later. We know that organizations that engage in wildfire risk mitigation and adaptation activities are both public and private organizations. As others have said in the past, we also recommend investing in professional positions to strategically coordinate across these jurisdictional and ownership boundaries to better support collective action for adaptation 
to wildfire in ways that might be more red or excuse me that might more readily match the decades of R and D investment that built readily available data like satellite imagery and census data. Actualizing these principles means building an approach to wildfire that Stephen Pine describes as involving history as well as geography that must meld culture with nature. We believe an integral part of these principles is the need to consider how existing institutions, organizations, research, research paradigms, practices, funding structures, and relationships surrounding wildfire management can evolve and flex to better facilitate living with fire. In other words, instead of trying to reduce the complexity inherent in the system, a more realistic approach would be to account for it. So here are our take home points. Much of recent research practice and policies to address risk have primarily centered on building technical knowledge of wildfire risk and disseminating that, disseminating that knowledge to users. Of course, this work has been useful. But we argue that in contemporary society, complex risk is a better, more representative conceptual guide for addressing wildfire risk today. Expanding the repertoire of approaches around wildfire management will ne necessitate a normative shift to be more inclusive, just, and dynamic. That is not to say current approaches are necessarily unjust, but it simply recognizes that an approach that treats wildfire as a complex risk explicitly accounts for such considerations in the foreground, rather than assuming they will be tended to in the background. Ultimately, more inclusive activities and processes can help build an approach to wildfire risk more likely to improve future outcomes by explicitly recognizing the complexity of the problem. To close, we do not want to suggest that what we have articulated here represents all the answers or solutions to address gaps regarding wildfire risk. Instead, we hope to further spur the conversation, the dialogue that can surface additional questions and innovations that contribute to strategic action to support such a shift over short and long-term time horizons. Thanks so much, I'm happy to take questions. Maureen, it looks like we have two questions that have come up. The first one is, have you seen a co-op model where residents agree to donating a fee or donating their time? You know, that's a great question and that's a great um, potential um, solution, unique solution um, and approach to engaging in collective action. You know, different um, homeowners associations, for example, um, may have experience with doing some of these things. But again, as um, I noted and Susan's introductory presentation noted, um, that approach may work in some neighborhoods, in some communities, but it may not work in, in all communities. The other question was entered before your presentation. So I think you covered a lot of it, but the question was, what are the main challenges and how do you overcome them in promoting collective action in a very diverse cultural landscape? farmers, indigenous people, et cetera? Wow, what a fantastic question. Thank you. Um, I mean, I think Susan underscored quite a lot of the challenges um, in promoting collective action. I would say from the agency standpoint, um, one of the biggest challenges is um, resourcing um, that coordinated, coordinated action prior to a fire. I think there is, wide agreement. I'm going to hedge my bet to say there's wide agreement that there's good um, coordinated effort or better coordinated effort during actual incident management um, response. But we need to really um, increase that coordination before a fire happens and in the recovery process. So after the wildfire. So I think there's a lot that can be done there. And um, in specifically in relationship to indigenous people or you know, non-traditional partners, I think we have barely even scratched the surface with this. Um, and I really look forward to um, continuing to find ways to engage meaningfully with a diverse set of partners that haven't been engaged um, much or at all thus far. Thank you, those are all the questions. Great. Thank you. So I'm going to go ahead.
and shift to introducing our next speaker here. Travis Pavelio is an associate professor of natural resource sociology in the College of Natural Resources at the University of Idaho. Sorry about that, Travis, and take it away. All right, everyone can see my screen, I hope. Yeah, I'm Travis Pavelio. Uh, I have worked on the human and policy dimensions of welfare for a very long time often doing very site-specific case studies of what works and what doesn't work in places. I'll touch on some of that later, but the effort that I'm actually putting forward today is stepping back from that. It's more of approaching that idea of meta-theory of where social science fits in, in our notion of wildfire adaptation and what it can provide. And the reason for that is because there is this growing acknowledgement and has been for many decades that the human components, the social dynamics that are going on in a landscape or the political dynamics are really important. Although that recognition has been growing, I'm gonna be real honest and say that it's often still very much marginalized and not seen as something that helps us conceive of wildfire adaptation as this process that has all these trade-offs. Uh, and that we still tend to, just like Mo was getting at, focus on this simple definition of the science should tell people what to do. And as a social scientist, I still get people that come to me and say, well, why don't people just, why can't you convince them to do what I want? And those are things that are a really big impediment um, as someone was just asking in the question. And so I tend to find that we still conceptualize of social science as this outreach wing where people will come and say, what interventions do I need to do to make sure that my people on the ground or the people working in my landscapes will do these things that I created at a high policy level or to advance some type of technological advancement or new technique or introduction of prescribed fire in a place it hadn't that we haven't done in the past. And those are really valuable functions of social science, but they're certainly not the only ones. Uh, and I would argue that social science instead is something that can have a lot of value on the front side of not only studying the production of that science, but also looking at wildfire as not something we're trying to solve, but something that we are trying to progress in adaptation with differently across different pieces in the landscape. And the way I describe it in the paper, and by the way, if any of this resonates with any of you, the paper for this is already out. It's the cover uh, article for the Journal of Forestry this month. That will do a far better job of a very complex argument that I'm gonna get at here. But what I'm gonna to try to do is give you whet your appetite a little bit for that. So how do we conceive of social science in a different way, in a broader sense and where it fits? And the way that I decided to do that was to step back and use some of my social science training, uh, both in communication and sociology to say, well, we need to reframe that instead of talking in very technical terms. And I wanna provide a vehicle through which people can see the way where social science fits in. And that gets to these ideas of framing or narrative, the fact that we as human beings really like to see things as comparisons or like to see things as a story. And those are present throughout all of our fire history and they're also the reason for some of our problems. Uh, framing fire is fighting fire or fire exclusion or now fire adapted communities. All of these are people taking on one little piece of social science and trying to use it for their purposes. And sometimes it's great, sometimes it bombs horribly and causes us to spend decades trying to reconvince people of what they should think about fire. So I said, why don't I use that to my advantage? And really this entire paper, something very different was written as this idea of how can I create an overarching analogy that people can conceive of these technical things uh, in a way that has a different visualization. And that centered around this notion that what wildfire adaptation, what social science provides to it is that it helps elevate wildfire management from checkers and chess. And I'll talk about why that is in a moment, because really what this is about and what all of my research and decades of other social science research have shown, and there's a lot of wildfire social science, it's spread out across places. And I think there are consistent lessons that we don't necessarily always have to pull from meta theory from other places. It's just that we haven't coalesced well around it. Is it really, it's about designing adaptation that builds up over time across landscapes. So picking the right scale at which action is currently possible looking to other populations that have different ways of organizing or different incentives and slowly building up. And that's the only way that we're really gonna to get to some of these high policy kind of ideas that people are putting forward without really an idea of how to do it. And that's that notion of we're gonna do landscape level treatments, we're gonna do landscape level management, everyone's gonna agree upon fire. You can't do that unilaterally. And so we need to think about a different way. So trackers and chess, they're both playing on the same board. So I want you to think of it this way, that if we think of the landscape 
as this board that everyone hopefully has had some experience with, but if you haven't, there it is. Chess and checkers are both played on the same board, just different pieces. And checkers or draughts, if you're from certain countries, I know that it's sometimes called that. You have these pieces that all start with the same abilities. Everyone's the same. They can all move in only the same way. Chess isn't like that. Chess is much more complex in that there are all these different pieces with different resources, abilities, understandings, and everything else. And what that means is when you progress from checkers to chess, you're dealing with a whole different set of circumstances. You have to think about the way the, play, the pieces play off of one another. And so if we take that landscape and we consider each individual landowner or each individual agency or organization as a different piece, they're in this shared landscape and what they do and what ownerships they have and what practices they put forward for forestry or range management or reactions to evacuation or setting up fuels treatments are all going to somehow have some effect on the other pieces in there. And I think that if you look across all that social science, the big thing that comes through is that we've been saying for decades, you should be playing chess and you're playing checkers. You're not paying attention to all of the details of what people can and can't do and look at the strategic things that are possible and the things that aren't possible, the strengths people have, how you can use them in a strategic way. And so that's a lot of what this paper is trying to get people to reframe and rethink about. That in essence, in any place that you're trying to do some wildfire work or trying to engage a new way of a policy or a program or a treatment or an incentive or a new firefighting strategy, you're joining a game that's been in progress for a very long time. Those pieces are already moved around on the board. And if you don't understand those, if you don't understand the relationships between those pieces, what their different values are, how they're different and how they aren't, you're going to come in and you're going to put your foot down pretty hard. And you're probably not going to get a lot of buy-in from people in that purpose. And you're really not going to create those relationships that over time build to that. And so I see a lot of people who are moving in the direction of, yes, the social science matters and we should do something about it. But I don't think they're plotting the board. And that's what social scientists do. Um, that's what our data can provide. So in this game, pieces are always progressing. And these coordinated pieces that Susan and Mo were talking about, they're there and they're possible. But we tend to treat them as something that is a given. And it certainly isn't. And it means that what we really need to do, and Susan set me up pretty well, I do think that there is some blueprints at smaller scales, and I'd hope to see with this paper a bigger blueprint for how you can approach that diversity and that social diversity of differences across ownerships, populations, and people, and look at it systematically in a way that you can actually start to work through that about what is going to be most effective in different circumstances. And in the biggest sense, that starts with three different choices or three different considerations, which is Walking into a given landscape, you have to think about the scale and scope at which collective action is currently possible. The high lofty goals of getting everyone to work together are probably not the reality. Is there a particular neighborhood? Are there two agencies that can currently work together? Is there a timber company that can right now work with a power company? You need to figure those things out first and start where the action is actually possible. And then you have to take stock of that social diversity. And uh, if anyone is interested in that, I have a series of papers with a number of co-authors where we've developed an actual framework for doing that. Particular steps, particular things that you can look for. And it's through those things that you start to see where there are unique populations or communities of people who can work across those lines and are currently capable of moving forward in different directions. And if we get them moving forward in different directions, we can eventually get them to meet up. I call these the club rules of the landscape, right? You have to understand where the board is, who everybody is on the board, if you're gonna do something about it. In the paper, I go pretty hard on that analogy. And I use this uh, notion of a firewise community in a particular community that's looking at these things. And so they are considering whether or not firewise, which for those of you who are not familiar, firewise is a program often working at the neighborhood or community level to get people to do fuels reduction around their properties or collectively uh, around their neighborhood in ways that would match up. But they have to figure out the first thing is, does the firewise program work with what we wanna do and who we are and what we value? Uh, the wildlife habitat or the risk or the benefit that it provides? Is this the way we really like to organize? Do we trust the federal agency that's or a state agency that's helping promote these things? And what that really does is that helps them start to think about, does this work for our circumstances? Next, they have to think about the other pieces in that landscape and can a subsidy for or an incentive from one of those agencies help? Is it something that's going to be cooperative or is it going to be something that's going to be 
a detraction from what they're trying to do. Where are other pieces in the landscape going to block them? And maybe there's a hillside ordinance that doesn't let them do that fuels reduction. And so the paper goes into excruciating detail about that. But the point is that each of these communities should systematically collect that information, and they do. Uh, but we often don't take heed of that process and say, this is how people are actually understanding that need for adaptation and where they fit in. And if we don't account for that, we can often see why these initiatives fail. You move to a broader sense, to a landscape, and you're dealing with a larger sequence of moves. And so this idea that we're going to work at a landscape level uh, is a much more complex aspect of that, where you have to not only think about all of those pieces are right next to you, but a broader board and sequences that may go far into advance. And really well round chess players, that's what they're known for, right? It's being able to see and progress and collect data about that and look at all the different options that are available. And I would argue that we need to do a better job of systematically doing that in these different circumstances or building the capacity for people to do that. You get to that broader landscape and you deal with a broad sense of these different communities or agencies, which may be very different. And over a series of papers in the past, we've called that social fragmentation, that as you get more of that diversity and disagreement, or you're working at smaller scales of populations who are seeing wildfire adaptation differently, it's going to be much harder for you to actually work at that landscape level and why it's so important to start the scale where things are actually possible. So I say in the paper that assessing that social fragmentation is a critical part of understanding that landscape. And what we often talk about in our papers, which is community development, is really about making sure that that board and those people on there can start to see some common ground to work together on. So I call it the opposing force to those things. And here again in the paper is the analogy to that, uh, that as you get more and more of the social fragmentation on the right side, what you're actually dealing with is more players with different values, with different ideas, with different policies that may counteract one another or might not work together in the service of the larger landscape. But that process of community development, which there's a lot of literature about, is simplifying your circumstances. It's getting everyone to move in the same direction. It doesn't remove things like cultural aspects or anything like that, but it finds the coordinated aspects where they meet up and where people can see common benefit to that purpose. So that means an expanded set of considerations. And uh, in the paper, I go into detail on those, but it's really those same set of considerations but looking broader at what other pieces on the board there are and the potential influences. And again, I think there are actually frameworks and that exist for this already, and I'll get to some of those in a moment. But here we see that there's just more of those things going forward. And so if you look at a landscape, you need a matrix of all of these things together. You need to look at it comprehensively the same way that we look at it with fuels inventories or anything else. And I've argued that for a very long time and trying to do so more in this paper in a systematic way that Really, we need to systematically collect that information so that we can see against these other metrics and other simulations that we have where there's possibility and where there isn't from that social science side. It's not just convince people to do what I want. I go into additional detail on that. And the notion is that a lot of people are talking about the different scalar aspects of fire. We're going all the way up to national levels. We're talking about global aspects of fire. And I think that this analogy can work well in that too, but it also shows why it's so important to understand that site specific. If you're familiar with chess, you know there's a bunch of different variants, one of which is 3D chess, where there's different levels, which you can see there on the right. And so if we consider one of those boards, it's a landscape, we have the local or landscape context. We also have county or state context where policymakers are making choices or releasing incentives to help people for these purposes. At the federal level, we have agencies and governments deciding how we should prioritize certain things or the criteria for them. All these things are happening at the same time. I often end up studying whether or not they're actually working across boards or whether there's disconnects, and there often are. And so I thought this was a healthy way of looking at it in a way that might get people to see that you know, all these things are operating. And what I think is interesting to focus on where social science can be helpful is what I call these attack boards, which in chess is progresses, allows you to progress between these different scales. We're just now starting to focus on what those things are and see programs that really do that. And I talk about that as these agencies or people are coming forward and saying, I can help you translate that science, or I can help you convince these people, or I can give out that program money effectively. I call these people board hopping organizations. And I don't know that they're always well conceived of yet. We're using all of these previous understandings about what works in different places and matching people up effectively. And so I think it's really exciting to see that happening, but social science should also do a lot of work to see who's actually doing that, who we're benefiting, if it's equitable, 
and what is strategic in terms of those things working out. And I give a couple of very specific examples to the US context in the paper, if you're interested in that purpose. And the other point to say with this is that you often have a lot more boards operating at the local level. There's only so many people operating at these state and federal levels in that hierarchical system of government, but there's so much diversity at the local level that we often miss a bunch of those. We find that our programs and our incentives or policies are only really benefiting some people more than others because they fit that idea of what we think of as fire risk or fire management, coming again predominantly from the science and not necessarily from what's actually possible. So what should we do about these things? Uh, this is in the corner here uh, over the last oh, 16, 17 years with Dan, with Matt Carroll, with Pam Jakes and others. Um, we developed a, a series of theoretical processes and considerations that help you understand where you might have different communities across a landscape and what to look for in those and how they match up to different programs or policies or different messages that come forward. And I would advocate that there's also a very good model of that with the FACNET organization as well, and this is their FACNET wheel. We need to build on those things and we need to build them into our systematic way that we're assessing our progress towards adaptation. But it means understanding those club rules that I talked about, and it means rethinking this fire adaptation process as a negotiation with all these different populations that are operating at lower levels, not just telling them these are the things science should tell you to do. And the paper also go into a lot of detail about this notion of coordinators, uh, where in the US West, we have a number of states that are trying to get people who actually are going to work at these interfaces and work with different populations. And I think that those folks predominantly have kind of grown into their jobs and they've struggled mightily with the fact that they're dealing with all these different perspectives. And I would advocate that some very targeted social science training and looking for those people in different places and situating them outside of agencies um, and not under the purview of, of politicians is going to make them much more effective because they can call bull crap on things, pardon my French, uh, or they can have the freedom to actually look at these things in an innovative way and in a comprehensive way that they would need to. So the other big considerations I make in this and then I'll be done is that we need to look at these different ways in which people are trying to move across boards and what they're using for that purpose. Uh, in the paper, I use the Example of an RFPA, which was something I studied in Oregon and Washington. They are ranchers who have organized to work with agencies to do first response on very remote lands, and they've tied in to the system. But they understood what they were both trying to do, and they had the legislation to do it, and it's working effectively. This is translating across the boards. But who are we serving, and how do we serve them differently is really, really important, especially when we look at things like collaboratives or CFLRP, or if you're in Europe, uh, fire smart territories and everything else. Who's coming to the table? Is this actually something that's equitable or is this just another way that certain special interests are driving what it is that we're doing? Nothing is good or bad. It's just always a series of considerations of what's best for our collective adaptation. So we need to look at those things and we need to know that wildfire management is that variable and contingent purpose. And again, if you're interested in very specific details of that in many case studies, look up my past papers with other people you can see site-specific cases where we talk about how this manifests in different places all over the West. But the purpose behind this was I wanted to say this in a different way. And I wanted this large overarching analogy that provides meta theory and shows that there's a lot of really good work in wildfire social science. And we don't always have to pull from some other grand theory from some other discipline anymore, that we have enough momentum underneath us to start moving forward with our own ideas that meet those things in the middle. And I think that could be expanded over time. So thank you for your time. Great, thank you, Travis. Um, and it looks like we don't have time for questions. So hopefully we can get in some a little bit later. Um, so we're just gonna quickly shift to our next presenter. Um, and so this time we have Daniel R. Williams. <laughs> Dan Williams is a research social scientist with the USDA Forest Service Rocky Mountain Research Station in Fort Collins. His recent work looks at place-based conservation and governance of natural resources. Take it away, Dan. Okay, thank you, Mo. I think I got it set up. Are we uh, seeing my presentation, hopefully? Yeah, it looks great. Okay, I don't know why there's this little box here. Slideshow, Zoom slideshow, okay. Um, well, thank you, Mo, and thanks for the to the previous speakers. I think um, we have an opportunity um, to build on um, you know, what we've heard so far 
and um, particularly the idea of, of the coordination problem, I would say from Susan, sort of a mindset question from Mo, and this idea of social fragmentation and sort of the complex uh, chessboard on which we are trying to solve this um, collective action problem. So thanks for uh, joining us for this session. Um, in my presentation, I want to link, I should mention, by the way, that Mo is also a co-author on it. So I should say in our presentation, we want to link uh, collective action to a class of problems, uh, which we call wicked problems. And you've already heard a little bit about that and suggest that uh, there's an analogy here to the idea of clinical practice. Um, that is kind of a case-based problem solving strategy. In other words, there's a need for a science of practice in addition to our traditional wildfire science. Let's see if I can get these right buttons to move here. There we go. Um, so this presentation will be mostly conceptual, one that attempts to untangle several related concepts associated with collective action. Um, wicked problems, I already mentioned, this idea of clinical reasoning or, or clinical problem solving, the ideas of place-based knowledge, and particularly the concepts of phronesis and mythos, which come from sort of Greek um, Aristotelian concepts of knowledge. Let's see if I can fix this here. So um, I'm still not getting the button to move. There we go. All right. Um, I don't know why I'm having a little bit of glitchy problems here. So um, what are the characteristics of a wicked problem? The idea here is that there are actually many definitions that have been used to talk about wicked problems. Um, actually, shoot, I skipped the slide. I'm sorry. This. Try to go back. There. Okay. Sorry about that. So, collective action as a transboundary um, wildfire risk problem. Collective action problems represent a situation in which all the individuals would be better off cooperating, but often fail to do so. And, and um, Susan talked about some of the reasons. I would just highlight partly it's simply that their mutual interests conflict uh, with a potential shared or joint or mutual action. But very often, um, there's also just a failure, and this is sort of the coordination problem, a failure to recognize uh, the need to connect, interconnect, organize collective action across, uh, in this case, transboundary um, conditions, conflicting mandates and goals. In other words, they, they, they don't really know how to solve this problem collectively because they see it mostly still as an individual problem. This makes for what I wanted to talk about, wicked problems. A wicked problem, um, as I said, are, are these difficult or impossible problems to solve by technical means because of incomplete, contradictory, or changing requirements that often uh, are difficult to, to recognize. Um, there are many different definitions or different attributes that people associate with these problems. So this particular graphic here just represents one collection of these types of features. Among them, I would emphasize particularly this idea of multiple stakeholding or rights holding. Some people you know, think of it as broader than stakeholding. Um, the social complexity, the kinds of things that Travis mentioned, this idea of the interconnected features or issues that are uh, sort of entrained in a collective action problem, and in particular, inability to test solutions in advance. They all point to the need to develop customized solutions fitted to specific case or a specific circumstance. Some of this presentation also builds on a book chapter I did in this book, New Strategies for Wicked Problems. So, and there's a lot of great ideas in the other chapters in that book if you're interested in this topic of wicked problems. Uh, kind of a fun example of this uh, idea of a wicked problem. Uh, or an illustration, if you will, comes from some work by Matt Carroll and his colleagues at Washington State University that appeared in the Journal of Forestry, um, 2007, I guess it was. You can see here that there are many complex interactions, many are complex features that are inter interacting that would be hard to organize or to generalize from one place to another. Um, so this is what in part makes it difficult or complex is because they manifest themselves differently in different places. So uh, part of this um, 
wicked, wickedness, if you will, springs from the, what, what I would characterize as an unrelenting science practice gap, particularly the failure to consider local context or context-dependent knowledge and practice. For example, much of the social and, and biophysical sciences practiced inside natural resource agencies like the Forest Service that I work for adopts a technocratic deductive approach. Mo described this in some detail in her presentation. In other words, we sort of have this, this idea of, of this sort of technocratic attempt to chase down these wicked problems that really isn't sufficient to address them only using these highly generalized deductive strategies. Um, in the book, Seeing Like a State by James Scott, um, he in particular details the failure of these sort of technocratic approaches to consider local knowledge and the circumstances for what he calls state failure. His thesis is that generalized knowledge is too often abstract to compare an understanding of the local circumstances to, to capture, I'm sorry, um, understanding of local circumstances. Um, this is the practical knowledge that he, he talks about that he borrows the term mitos from the Greeks, which is a form of local experiential knowledge that resists simplification into these sort of deductive principles, um, principles that can be transferred through book learning, and that these ideas represent the practical skills that underwrite any complex activity. Squil skills, sorry, skills acquired through apprenticeship or clinical training in case-specific knowledge. Um, making a similar argument, um, uh, a Dutch scholar by the name of Bent Fleefberg that's my best pronunciation, I guess, of his name, uh, talks about the idea of phronesis, which refers to practical wisdom that comes from an intimate familiarity with the contingencies and uncertainties of various forms of social practice embedded in complex social settings. Both of these examples emphasize the importance of, of context or place-based knowing over sort of the simplifications or reductions that we get from highly generalized knowledge. That is the importance of knowledge nested in the context of time or local circumstance. So um, some of the ways in which people talk about this idea of clinical knowledge is using something called the Dreyfus model. Um, Dreyfus tried to describe skill acquisition through a series of, of five stages from novice, competence, proficiency, expertise, and mastery. Um, this model is often used in fields like education, management, and various forms of clinical practice, medicine, and so forth. Um, the model proposes that students, as they progress through these different stages, um, move from following sort of explicit rules or principles that they learn, for example, in a book or some rote way, to more intuitive and almost improvisational based actions where sometimes they act without really being able to describe or explain the reasons for their actions. They understand the system that they're uh, working with so well that it, it, it appears to them in almost an intuitive kind of way. Oops, I guess maybe I was behind on the slide. There we go, sorry about that. Let me put that back up um, just real quickly. Um, the Dreyfus model is what I was trying to describe here a minute ago. Okay, um, looking at uh, this idea of the, the idea of communities of practice, this is another concept that um, has, is popular with uh, people who talk about clinical practice. A lot of this work was done by Wenger in a book uh, published in 1998, where he describes a community of practice as uh, organized in sort of three domains or three characteristics of, I should say, a community of practice. One, there's a domain, an area of shared interest or shared uh, issues. In this case, it might be wildfire um, adaptation. There's a community, meaning a set of relationships built up through discussion activities and learning, things like conferences and workshops, uh, like what we're at now. And then the idea of a body of knowledge or practice um, that includes methods, uh, tools, stories, and so forth. Um, on the right, we can think of this a little bit as uh, kind of somewhere between, community practice being somewhat between what might be work teams in like a formal organization where there's, they share complex knowledge um, say in this, say the Forest Service has work teams working on uh, wildfire uh, adaptation, but we could also think of in more informal ways the idea of social networks, which which are a little more loosely organized, um, although they take on some of the characteristics of communities of practice. And I think this idea of the fire adapted communities network 
is a good example of sort of an incipient or nascent community of practice. But the question really is, are we, are we really pursuing these things to the point where they become more identifiable, identifiable communities of practice? So uh, this is a bit of an uh, ab abstract look at this, but this is the way I, I think about and organize knowledge when we're talking about this idea of, of some sort of fused from somewhere, someplace, something very specific, like a specific case, the kind of thing that's nurtured in, in um, clinical practice from what we might call the more technocratic knowledge, the view from nowhere, um, or it could be even technocratic problem solving, so specific policies and practices, for example. In this model, which I build from uh, geographer uh, Robert Sack, the idea with the cone is that as you move further and further away from a specific case, knowledge becomes more siloed and, and segmented into certain disciplines or, or bodies of practice that are hard to integrate. I mean, we can try to write algorithms and things, but they're actually very hard to integrate and adapt to uh, local circumstance. And in this case, I have the cohesive strategy of uh, landscape resilience, fire adapted communities and response as what we're trying to adapt all of this different knowledge to in an integrated uh, uh, approach that's fitted to the case. And one way I think about this is kind of like, I come from a long line of carpenters, I should say. And I've thought about this a lot is that, a carpenter has a lot of tools, a lot of tools on their tool belt, a lot of tools in the truck. I used to work as a kid for my father. I would, he would send me down to the truck to find the tool that he needed uh, in order to get his job done. But it takes at least four years of apprenticeship to learn how to, to use all these different tools and put them to good effect in a wide range of circumstances like custom home building. No two applications are the same. So this is this kind of skilled action that we're talking about in the kind of... Um, uh, notion of a of a um, of a community of practice or a clinical area of practice. Um, I should mention that we, this isn't the same exactly the same as local scale versus national scale, but the idea that knowledge needs to be applied to specific circumstances and needs to be adjusted. Um, broad policies, data, and models are tools, simply tools that need to be deployed employed by situated practitioners to make them useful. And so, and again, this is this idea of things like the coordination capacity and the, and the things that out there in the real world actually solving problems, if you will, on the ground, we need people who are capable of making these, these um, uh, translations from, from the technical know-how into sort of more customized solutions. So, if we just kind of as a review here, wildfire as a collective action problem requires this idea of cult cultivating relationships and capacities for working or governing um, problems across, we talk about jurisdictional boundaries, landscape scales, the diversity of missions and mandates, the different organizational cultures, federal, state, local, and so forth, and the varying perceptions of risk. And Mo talked a lot about that. And all of this can be sort of advanced by cultivating a clinical community of practice for wildfire mitigation and adaptations. Here, the idea is that it takes many minds to solve collective action problems. And we um, can advance those many minds and train those many minds through um, more formalized communities of practice. So just as one example where we've tried to do this a little bit in this project uh, that I work with called Comfort out of the Rocky Mountain Research Station. Um, one of the things that uh, we have a subgroup out of um, Portland State led by Max Nielsen Pincus and Cody Evers that's been doing some, some social network mapping for some cross-boundary wildfire um, places that we've been working in, one in North Central Washington and one in Northern Utah. And here you can see how their different networks, which are um, built up through a kind of chain referral that, that they can then map and understand who works with whom. And in this case, we've organized these things, or I should say they've organized these things into different categories of agencies. For example, in North Central Washington, you see sort of the green tinted ones representing the Forest Service, 
the state is the, the bluer dots and the NGOs are the magenta. Is that what, is that that color? Um, and you see there that the network is, is very complex and, and well-developed, but that the interesting thing is that the NGOs seem to be playing a particularly prominent role in connecting and inter interconnecting the various actors trying to solve these problems. Whereas in Northern Utah, what is interesting there is that the state seems to be playing a more central role um, through uh, some of the programs and policies that they've adopted specific to Utah. So there are historical or situational differences, if you will, in how these networks develop. And we think we can help map these networks and then help build them into stronger communities of practice. So taming wickedness. Um, I guess our sort of one of our takeaways here is that we need to build a clinical community of practice. We need to ask questions about the domain of knowledge. Are we cultivating case-based knowledge um, in terms of community? Who shows up in those networks, for example, that I just described? And what, in fact, is the quality of their relationships in those networks? And, and Max and others have done some work on the quality of those relationships. And then the practice. What are what is that network or people in this community of practice ability to share, learn, and innovate. And I think somebody, I think it was Susan also mentioned the importance of resources and capacities uh, are required to move towards higher adaptedness. So you can think of this as kind of how do we go from the sort of loosely organized social networks that we're beginning to map to um, well-organized, well-funded, well-trained, um, people who aren't just simply volunteers doing this work, but are actually have the resources and time and capacity to develop the kind of skills that we need to advance um, these collective action problems. And finally, um, we, we have this idea of, of um, just to sort of close the loop here, clinical focus on the science of practice um, in, in this, we're talking about the idea that the deductive science or this highly generalized science is not sufficient to galvanize cross-boundary collective action, in part because it takes coordination. It takes people who know what coordination looks like and know how to uh, sort of incentivize and, and, and uh, um, galvanize coordination. Um, these wicked problems require building these sorts of these more functional communities of practice. Um, this kind of clinical knowledge involves linking the different learners together, co-learning, you hear these terms now, co-learning, social learning, uh, co-production, and even institutional changes that are built around these ideas um, that help people assess, identify, assess, and share what people know and do in actual practice. And this requires, and I think this is maybe a message we keep hearing in this uh, session, requires investment in con context-specific professional networks of fire risk practice. You can think of this as the notion of phronesis, this habit or this ability to make the right decision and take right action in context um, and the, sort of the pursuit of excellence for the common good, that's something that Susan also fleshed out. And, and more and more, we see this notion of phronesis showing up in professional dialogues about what it does, what, what is a profession and what makes it different say than just science or um, or practice. Um, and I think I will leave it there. Um, maybe there's time for a question. Thanks, Dan. Um, we don't have time for questions, so we're going to have to go ahead and move right on to our next presentation. So um, I will go ahead and introduce Gretchen. Gretchen Ingbring is an ORISE postdoctoral fellow with the US Forest Service Pacific Northwest Research Station based out of Corvallis, Oregon, and supervised by Susan Charnley. Her work with the station's West Side Fire Initiative focuses on how federal, state, tribal, and large private landowners and managers collaborate across property boundaries and address fire and carbon through their forest management in the Pacific Northwest. Gretchen, go ahead. Perfect. Hi, everyone, and thank you for the introduction, Mo. Um, let's just get into it, starting with a little bit of background. Um, so I personally feel like it's always pouring rain up here in the Pacific Northwest, um, but roughly 2 million acres burned across Washington and Oregon last year alone. And while wildfires have periodically burned across the region with varying consequences, good and bad, 
recent large scale fires, along with growing populations and expanding wildland urban interface, drought and high temperatures are all factors that have drawn particular attention to wildfire in the region. So of course, wildfires, especially big ones, tend to ignore property lines. So the example here shows a recent wildfire that ignited on forest service land and subsequently crossed multiple ownerships before it was contained and ultimately extinguished. Thus, not only has there been a renewed interest in wildfire in the Pacific Northwest, um, but as Susan discussed in her presentation, there is also an interest in cross-boundary collective action that addresses fire. However, research on wildfire in the Pacific Northwest, as well as cross-boundary management in the context of wildfire in the region, has largely focused on central and eastern portions of Washington and Oregon. So as you can see from this map, this is somewhat fitting, given that lands east of the Cascades tend to be characterized by much higher frequency fire regimes, which are shown here in that sort of reddish pink color. Conversely, lands west of the Cascades tend to be characterized by much lower frequency fire regimes, shown on this map in blue, with one major exception being the Klamath. So while numerous examples of cross-boundary management in the context of wildfire have been documented on the east side and indi indicate potential or at least perceived potential, there is considerably more room for work in western portions of the region. So one example of cross-boundary collective action that illustrates this is the Joint Chiefs Landscape Restoration P Partnership. And this national scale partnership between the Forest Service and NRCS includes projects that, and I'll quote from their website, mitigate wildfire risk, improve water quality, and restore healthy forest ecosystems on public and private lands. So as you can see here, 17 of these projects are located in Washington and Oregon and Northern California. However, if you recall that map from the previous slide, you can see how these projects are largely in the Eastern Cascades and Klamath, with one exception being that purple dot you see in Northwest Oregon. Of course, this is just one example of cross-boundary collective action, but it does demonstrate a central and Eastern focus on cross-boundary collective action, which raises the question, what does cross-boundary collective action to address wildfire look like in west side forests and why? So answering this question can add nuance to our current understanding of cross-boundary management, especially in the context of wildfire on the west side. And practically exploring this question may also help policymakers, forest landowners and managers and supporting organizations better prioritize limited resources and target and design cross-boundary efforts that are more context appropriate. So to answer this question I just posed, we've been conducting interviews with forest owners and managers in the region. Eligibility for these interviews was determined by the four key things you see listed here. So we chose to conduct interviews with public, tribal, and private forest land owners and managers holding 5,000 or more acres west of the Cascade Crest in Washington, Oregon, and Northern California. To ensure that we're including a range of ecological conditions and varying fire regimes in particular, we used five EPA ecoregions to delineate our study area, which you can see in the map to the right of the slide there. These boundaries loosely resemble the map of the fire regimes I showed you earlier, with the Klamath experiencing more frequent fires than the Coast Range or much of the North Cascades and Puget Lowland. Um, and the Cascades is somewhere in between in terms of fire frequency and intensity with more frequent fires in the southern reaches of the range. So given the parameters I just mentioned, we then randomly selected nine BLM field offices and 21 Forest Service Ranger districts to include in the study. We also chose to pursue interviews with all 10 of the tribal nations in our study area who hold 5,000 or more acres. For state lands, we randomly selected nine Washington DNR districts to include the study, all four of the Oregon State Forests and the single California State Forest in our study area. For large private owners, we, stri we used striated random sampling to select 40 ownerships of varying sizes from across our study area and eco regions. So this ultimately resulted in 94 ownerships to include where one ownership equates to one interview in most cases. However, we've conducted multiple interviews for a single ownership in some cases and one interview for multiple ownerships in others. Now, this research is being conducted as part of a broader initiative and thus interviews covered a whole wide range of topics. Um, however, the questions we asked that are most relevant to today include those that explored managers' concern over wildfire, any management they were undertaking to address wildfire, their fire history and frequency, and their suppression efforts. We also asked participants about their cross-boundary management, including which types of lands bordered their own, management activities they were engaging in with their neighbors, their motivations for these activities, and the outcomes of such efforts, especially related to wildfire. We also asked respondents to identify barriers to management in both of those areas. 
So as of today, we've done about 30 interviews with tribal, federal, and state forest land owners and managers with some interviews, including multiple participants. So I really wanna emphasize the preliminary nature of the themes that I'll be discussing today, especially given our low end. That said, we are seeing some saturation among state and federal interviews in particular, where we're consistently hearing many of the same themes. And as you'll note by the asterisk, um, I'm also excluding interviews with large private landowners from today's talk. Of course, our interviews with public and tribal managers discuss their cross-boundary work with private owners as well, so private lands do come up in that context. Another thing to note is that many interviews covered multiple ecoregions, but the numbers you see here represent the ecoregions that we focused our questions on in each respective interview. We also conducted three state-level interviews, which are represented in the white circles there on the slide. So let's get back to the original question, what does cross-boundary forest management to address wildfire look like on the west side? I'll start with our findings for the first part of that, what does it look like? Um, and you may recall that we asked interviewees about the types of lands bordering their own and asked them to identify which type of cross-boundary activities they engaged in. So this table summarizes their responses. Um, the highest percentages here are shown in green, whereas the lowest are shown in an orange red and the middle in that gold color. So for example, roughly 76% of our participants who had private corporate neighbors suggested that they communicated with them about forest management. Given the preliminary nature of these results, however, I don't want to draw too much attention to those specific percentages. Instead, I want to generally highlight that most folks are, at minimum, communicating with their neighbors. To a lesser extent, many are sharing resources, namely roads. However, relatively few are actually working across boundaries to coordinate forest management strategies and implement them. Now, notably, this table isn't even specific to cross-boundary management undertaken to address fire. Um, what you see here captures communication, resource sharing, coordination, and joint implementation that's being done for a whole variety of reasons. So in fact, outside suppression activities, um, the public and tribal managers that we've interviewed to date have referenced only a handful of instances where cross-boundary work was undertaken specifically to prevent or mitigate the negative impacts of wildfire. Additionally, these examples were largely from the Klamath and to a lesser extent, the Cascades. However, where wildfire was collectively addressed, it appeared to encourage more intensive coordination and implementation beyond the basic communication that we saw more broadly. So just to illustrate this, here's a quote from a federal manager in the Klamath Eek region. In this example, federal managers and private owners worked across boundaries to design and implement forest health treatments that simultaneously addressed sudden oak death and wildfire in the area. So going back to that initial question about what cross-boundary forest management looks like on the west side, well, we generally found that less intensive forms of cross-boundary management were the most common and consistent across all ecoregions, with most interviews reporting um, that they were communicating with their neighbors at a minimum, and many reporting that they were sharing roads. Other forms of resource sharing or coordinating and jointly implementing forest management strategies were relatively rare. Beyond suppression efforts, just a handful of managers reported engaging in cross-boundary forest management activities specifically to address wildfire. Those who did, however, were among the few that noted they were engaging in more intensive forms of collective action, including designing and implementing management across boundaries. And these examples were largely in the Klamath and Cascades ecoregion. So this brings us to the next part of the question, which is why is this what we're seeing? Well, we asked people what their motivations were for working across property lines. Some of the most common and consistent responses across the ecoregions included coordinating road and property access and, quote, just being a good neighbor. Other commonly noted motivations included policy direction, like the good neighbor authority, and providing access to or accessing cultural resources like huckleberries or cedar work. Cost savings were also cited, like sharing the same contractor across property lines, as were funding incentives. So that's to say working across jurisdictions to more competitively apply for funding. Habitat conservation and restoration were also cited in some instances, especially where controlling invasive species or disease was involved, um, as was watershed management, which overlapped to some extent with habitat conservation, especially in salmon bearing waterways. Now, as I mentioned earlier, we encountered very few examples of cross-boundary management beyond suppression undertaken to address wildfire specifically. And additionally, in most of these instances, wildfire as a motivator for cross-boundary management overlapped with one or more of the other things you see on the list here, just like in that quote that I showed you where Klamath area managers sought to address both sudden oak death and fire simultaneously. 
So this helps us understand, at least in, in part, why we're seeing or not seeing cross-boundary management. But given the theme of the conference, let's break down fire as a motivator just a little bit more. So as you may recall from our methods section, we also asked participants about their level of concern regarding whether wildfire would burn on their lands over the next 20 years. So a one meant that participants were not concerned, was a four meant that they were extremely concerned. Now we took all those ratings and we averaged them across ecoregions. As you can see here, average concern varied across our ecoregions with the Puget Lowland and Coast Range ecoregions representing the lowest levels of fire concern and the Cascades and Klamath ecoregions representing the highest levels of fire concern. Um, for the Klamath, note that everyone actually did say four, right? So extreme concern, except for one tribal land manager who said two, not because she thought wildfires wouldn't burn their lands, but because of her belief in the important role that fire plays on the landscape. So this example really illustrates how much perception depends on the ownership type and individual, and really should be taken with a grain of salt when looking at these average ratings, especially given low end values. That said, you can see how the level of concern generally reflects fire frequency with higher average concern ratings in ecoregions with more frequent fires like the Klamath and lower average concern ratings in areas with less frequent fires like the Coast Range. So respondents explanations for these readings also kind of back this up. Many directly referenced regional conditions and fire history as drivers of their concern and ultimately their interest in pursuing management across boundaries. So for just an example, one interview explained their low level of concern in the coast range, um, really just succinctly noting that we're not a fire forest. Another explained that their high level of concern in the Klamath was driven by, quote, the history of fire and the trends that we're seeing. So these quotes typify the responses we got for these ecoregions with lower frequency and higher frequency fire regimes, respectively. Managers whose lands have recently burned in 2020 and 2021, like in the Oregon Cascades, also cited recent fires, um, noted in that yellow box there, as driving their elevated levels of concern. So in cases where managers were concerned about wildfire and engaging in cross-boundary efforts to address it, they also provided us with their rationale. For example, the quote you see here in the bottom box is from a Klamath manager who explained that they were pursuing cross-boundary management because they were, quote, trying to manage fire in a landscape and it doesn't recognize jurisdictional boundaries. Conversely, the quote you see in the top blue box is from a manager in the Washington Coast Range. When asked, do you think working with your neighboring owners and managers could help reduce the impact of wildfire on your forest lands, he responded that fire just wasn't enough of a concern to engage in cross-boundary work on the topic. So in other words, if shared concern over fire promotes cross-boundary management to address it, then a lack of concern logically dampens it. So this said, um, recent fires, history of frequent fire, or concern over fire didn't alone guarantee cross-boundary collective action. Rather, our interviewees raised numerous enabling conditions that collectively drove cross-boundary management in addition to the motivators that we discussed earlier. So these enabling conditions are shown on the left side of the diagram and include, like we discussed in the context of fire, common concern over the issue. Interviewees also raised the importance of having the right personnel on both sides of the boundary, especially personnel who stayed in their positions long enough to build local relationships, and having a regulatory framework that enabled rather than hindered action. Other factors conducive to cross-boundary management included having shared goals across collaborators and having the resources to actually pursue collective action. Last but not least, perceived management potential was commonly raised. So in other words, if managers believed that certain management activities could have an impact on the occurrence or severity of wildfire on their lands, they were more likely to engage in these activities alone or with neighboring landowners and managers. If they believed that select activities were likely to have no or little effect, they were generally more reluctant to engage in these activities alone or across boundaries. Of course, there was a lot of variation in how different management activities and associated cross-boundary efforts were perceived, including across eco-region boundaries. So, for example, managers from the Coast Range, Puget Lowland, and some of the Cascades often suggested that their business-as-usual practices were sufficient fire deterrence under typical conditions. So this sentiment is expressed by a state manager in the Coast Range, shown in the box in blue. Um, however, managers in these areas were generally more skeptical about the impact that additional management undertaken to address wildfire could have on fire occurrence and severity on their lands. 
So for these managers, the common view was that if a fire were to start in their forests and grow beyond a few acres, it would be under conditions so atypically hot, dry, and windy that there wouldn't be much they could do. The quote you see here in yellow from a manager in the Cascades really exemplifies this thinking. Even if they were concerned, they suggested that the best they could do was stop fires before they started by educating forest visitors and users and restricting access, or they could spot and quickly extinguish fires when they did start. So accordingly, cross-boundary collective action in these areas might be more focused on maintaining or expanding road networks, access, outreach, and education, rather than, for example, on implementing additional thinning treatments to address wildfire. So, however, um, managers in the Klamath and some other parts of the Cascades generally demonstrated a pretty different logic. For these managers, fuel breaks, forest health and fuel treatments, and prescribed broadcast and cultural burns were both more common and perceived as more effective, especially if done at a larger scale. So consequently, we observed more of an appetite for scaling up activities, including across ownership boundaries. The quote you see here in the green box from a manager in the Klamath demonstrates this, to desire, this desire to scale up treatments. He said, quote, the same treatments that I get to do on a limited scale, I would just like to apply to most of the landscape. So just to reiterate, um, Cross-boundary collective action on the west side is motivated by a wide variety of factors from wildfire to just quote, being a good neighbor. The presence of cross-boundary collective action is also subject to numerous enabling factors, including available resources and personnel, shared goals and concerns, regulatory frameworks and perceived management potential. As both these motivating and enabling factors really do vary across the landscape and ecoregions, so too does the presence of cross-boundary management um, as well as the form that collective action takes. All right, so um, even I'm getting a little sick of hearing myself talk at this stage, so let's wrap things up and provide you all with just a few concluding remarks, even if our research is ongoing. So first, collective action to address wildfire looks different across the west side. That's hardly surprising, but I do think it's important to highlight and understand this variation so that when we establish new or expand existing cross-boundary initiatives to address wildfire, or develop policies to support this kind of collective action, we do so in a way that um, reflects these differences. Second, cross-boundary collective action isn't automatic. It doesn't simply appear because a transboundary issue arises. As we discussed, there are a whole lot of enabling factors that, when not present, preclude, prevent, or problematize collective action. So if we want to see more in the way of cross-boundary collaboration, we may also want to consider the presence or absence of these enabling factors. That said, cross-boundary collective action to address wildfire may not be uniformly desirable across the west side, at least not in the same form. I think this is important to highlight as large landowners, governments, and supporting organizations consider what to prioritize and where to invest limited resources in collective action. However, just because certain forms of collective action to address wildfire aren't desirable in some regions right now, that doesn't mean that they won't be in the future. So it's not the subject of today's presentation, but many of our interviewees referenced the changing social and environmental context in which they manage their forests. So in other words, where once fire was not a motivator for collective action, it may very well become a driver in the future, especially under climate change. So that brings me to my fifth and final point for today, which is that while we have observed relatively few intensive cross-boundary efforts to address wildfire on the west side, we did see numerous, albeit more minor forms of collective action, like communication. So should wildfire become more common on the west side, these cross-boundary communications and relationships could ultimately provide the foundation for future collective action around wildfire, even where they evolved around other issues. Um, and so with that, I just wanna say thank you for your time today. And I encourage you to send questions and comments now or email me later. Um, I definitely love to hear from folks about what information they'd be most interested in hearing about as we continue to conduct our interviews and analyze our results. So thank you very much. Great, thanks Gretchen. And we are out of time. So I wanna go ahead and thank all of our presenters um, and our producer as well for making this a fantastic session. We have a 20 minute break um, and I hope you will rejoin us for the second half of this special session. Thanks so much. Thank you.